you know, Ashley has agreed to stick around and answer some more of the questions. So welcome back, Ashley. We'll go ahead and get started. We have a couple of questions, and then we'll move on to our next presentation. So, um, all right, Ashley, our first question is about medication errors. Is a potential medication error considered an adverse event? And thank you for that question. Um, while a potential medication error would be reported um, into FAIRS, um, it would not be an adverse event. Uh, and maybe some confusing terminology, given the name of FAIRS, is an FDA adverse event reporting system. Um, but medication errors, with or without an adverse event, are reported into that system. So a potential medication error would be reported the same way but not considered an adverse event itself. Great. Thank you so much for clarifying. All right. And as a follow-up, another question about medication errors. How does FDA assess the seriousness of these medication errors that are reported? Thank you. Um, so. Their federal regulation defines a serious adverse event, um, and that's the definition that we use to define what a serious report is in FAERS, including the medication error report. Um, so that definition defines a serious adverse event um, as something that results in death, um, is life-threatening, results in hospitalization, um, disability, other serious important medical events, or um, a congenital anomaly or birth defect. Great, thank you. And does FDA act on label changes upon medication errors? Do they always enact them? So does FDA make label changes after hearing about the medication error reported, or are there any kind of labeling layout risk checks upon the marketing application when they're submitted? Sure, and thank you for that question. I think that um, really highlights what I was describing about um, considering these uh, risk assessments across the product development spectrum. So um, we don't only make recommendations about labels after receiving a medication error report in the post-market setting. Um, we do a very thorough pre-market labeling assessment um, of the marketing application and use a lot of the lessons learned as well as regulations and guidance for industry to really optimize the label prior to marketing. Um, but for the reasons I described, we continue to do surveillance for medication errors afterwards to see if labeling changes would be needed. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So our next question is about coding and dosages. So when you gave an example with respect to a plunger being hard to push down, and the recommended coding device is dif difficult to use, um, would there be a potential underdose be coded as well since the patient didn't get a full dose? Thank you for that question. Um, I think one of the things that that highlights is that there can be multiple um, terms that associate with a specific case. Um, so in this case, um, there is that the device was difficult to use, um, but also the medication error in terms of the patient is a, a missed dose, um, potentially, and um, what that question described is a plunger being difficult to push down. If no dose is delivered, a patient is missing a dose. So I don't necessarily think potential underdose would be the correct term, but a term such as missed dose or um, another type of error that the device issue resulted in would be appropriate to code with as well. Um, Great, thank you. Appreciate that answer. So this is going to be our last question before we move on to the next presentation. So Ashley, is there an algorithm or an FDA methodology followed to detect the minimum number of cases that will trigger or elicit an action by the agency? Thanks for that question. Um, 
So when we're assessing the cases, um, like I described, there's often um, a lot of reading narratives and trying to attribute what the, the root cause or contributing factors to a medication error may be. Um, while the number of cases may be one piece of information that informs um, our evaluation and ultimately our decision, um, there's not a set number of cases that are required for us to initiate that evaluation or for us to take action. Um, you know, a small number of cases with a, a very clear root cause and um, obvious mitigation strategy um, wouldn't be stopped because there, it didn't meet a threshold of a number of cases. Okay, great. Thank you again for your presentation and for taking two rounds of questions instead of just one, so that's excellent. I'm sure 